Lucas Oil Stadium will be haunted once again <laughs> in 2021. I am Lara Overton alongside the voice of the Colts, Matt Taylor, because nice T.Y. Hilton, nice Hilton is back for a 10th season to continue his career as an Indianapolis Colt, and rightfully so. It is where it all began, and based on these reports, we know that he potentially turned down a more lucrative offer elsewhere. He had many suitors across the NFL who wanted T.Y. Hilton on their roster moving forward, but ultimately, the heart won out. You had the pleads of the fan base, Mayte. Hashtag bring, bring TY home. It was trending all over social media. First and foremost, how indicative is this of the confidence TY Hilton has yep. in this offense and in the success of the Indianapolis Colts moving forward to know he's not going to go somewhere on the back end of his, of his career right. if he does not have a chance to win? I think it's confidence on both sides. It's confidence in T.Y. Hilton to come back and be a part of a winning team, a winning culture, a culture he knows very well. And then obviously the Colts showing faith in T.Y. Hilton to come back and be a leader and be a very productive player, which I think he still can be. I, I think it's I think it was very important for the Colts to prioritize a veteran free agent, not necessarily a free agent, but to have a wide receiver that is a veteran that has played up to the level of T.Y. Hilton on this roster next season, considering still mainly the core of your wide receiver group is still young and developing, so it makes a lot of sense to bring in a guy like T.Y. Hilton to kind of get the best out of that youth. Um, plus, he's been here for 10 years. I still think he can play at a very high level, so that makes the situation even better on both sides. Uh, but no, obviously, this is a guy that is. We we talked about it on on you know or on past shows. I mean, this guy is third all time, one of the best Colts ever. Third all time in receiving yards, fourth all time behind Marvin and Reggie. I mean, when you think about right. the names that he's, he is alongside, he's right there. Yeah. He's top five in everything when it comes to the passing game in Colts lore. So. Um, it makes a great deal of sense to make this move, and we'll see what happens going forward. But as you said, evidently T.Y. Hilton had suitors elsewhere on the open market, but I think his affinity for Frank Reich, this offense, and what this team is building kind of won out in his decision. And when you think about where T.Y. ranks on all of those different historical categories for the Indianapolis Colts, you think about how difficult the past few years have been for him based on the injury situation and working in with a number of different quarterbacks yeah. in recent history. Given the fact that he now has Carson Wentz to work with, yep. what type of position does this put T.Y. Hilton in in 2021 being 31 years old? A great question, and I think T.Y. Hilton, as I said, not to be the dead horse, but I don't think he's lost very much. Obviously not the player he was five, six years ago. He's not the same player he was on his rookie contract, but I think T.Y. Hilton can go back to being the game breaker, uh, the big play machine that he was because Carson Wentz is now his quarterback. We didn't really see that last year, the last two years really, with Jacoby Brissett and Phillip Rivers. The Colts still got their chunk plays last year, but it was different. I think T.Y. Hilton can go back to being that down the field deep threat that we've seen him be because Carson Wentz has a very live arm and throws a very accurate deep ball. T.Y. Hilton, in my opinion, can still run those deep outs. He can run the goes. He can line them up in the slot. He's still a yak receiver, yards after catch. And I still think he can be a great weapon inside the red zone. I mean, eight of his last 10 touchdowns have come inside the 20-yard line. So let's not forget that ability as well. You know, one of the things I always point to, it's funny, with Andrew Luck in 2018, Hilton had 1,270 yards, right? In his last 25 games, so the last two years, with Jacoby Brissett and, and Phillip Rivers as his quarterbacks, Hilton only has a combined 1,263 yards. That's seven yards less in the last two seasons combined. So I think those true deep shots come back. Another thing that I point to, last year Hilton averaged 11 yards per catch, very unlike T.Y. Hilton as far as production in that category is concerned. But with Luck as his quarterback in 2018, that number was 16 yards per catch. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that is a huge difference. And, you know, T.Y.'s never been a big, you know, catch per game guy. You know, he's never been a 8, 9, 10 catch per game. But I think he can go back next season to being 4 and 5 yards per catch high quantity in terms of yards per catch and get 80 to 90 yards per game. I still think he can play at that level. 
And one of those factors, Mayte, that you think about in regards to TY's dynamic with Phillip Rivers was the limited amount of time that they had ahead of the regular season. They had no offseason right. last spring, minimal time in training camp, no preseason. Given that factor and what we know of that Phillip Rivers dynamic with TY Hilton, not that Carson Wentz is Phillip Rivers, but you do have a quarterback coming in who has that kind of similar tra trajectory, the familiarity with Frank Reich coming into a new team for the first time in his NFL career after being with the Philadelphia Eagles. What do these next few weeks and months need to look like yeah. for Carson Wentz and T.Y. Hilton to be on that level of similar production to what we saw with Andrew Luck and T.Y. Hilton? Because one of the things that we know a lot of similarities that have been drawn is that Carson Wentz is somewhat of an Andrew Luck style quarterback. Yeah, I mean, in their heyday, Andrew Luck and T.Y. Hilton had an unspoken language. They were friends off the field, which obviously helped, but, you know, they had that body language on the field where they were in each other's head and they knew exactly what the other was thinking, which which led to a lot of, you know, subtle uh, things on the field and a lot of first downs and touchdowns when those two were playing at a very high level. So, you know, you, you talk about Carson Wentz's strengths and how they line up with kind of how Andrew Luck played. I totally agree with that. And the thing that's different this offseason that we didn't necessarily have last year, we were obviously in the infancy of the pandemic mm -hmm. and no one knew what was going on and the rules had to change. And the league, for the most part, was discouraging uh, f uh, players getting together on their own to work out to to build those new chemistries, especially when you had you know teams that had a new quarterback and new receivers, uh, i.e. Phillip Rivers last year. Obviously, the, the same is true this year. But I think the rules are a little bit more relaxed. You're not going to have the NFL, uh, you know, kind of putting their foot down. I think it, it makes perfect sense for Carson Wentz, which he's already shown flying all over the country to work out with new weapons. And obviously now with T.Y. Hilton signing a new contract, he can join in that fold. And it's all about reps. It's all about chemistry and, and get as much as that as you possibly can when training camp starts or whenever these guys can get back on the field in the offseason uh, during the springtime. For the depth of this wide receiver group, having T.Y. Hilton back alongside guys like Michael Pittman Jr. and Desmond Patman, who we know already got to work with Carson Wentz. They put out a video that they were working together in Southern California. And then you also have, you think about Paris Campbell, who still almost feels like he hasn't even gotten a full, you know, uh, opportunity underneath his Absolutely. belt, just given the injuries that he's dealt with. Zach Pascal is still very young. When you think about, you know, across the board, this wide receiver room, sure. how young it is, how impactful is T.Y. Y. Hilton's role as the veteran leader. We know he's not always the most vocal guy, but he certainly is a lead by example, and that's that role he inherited from Reggie Wayne. Absolutely. Like I said, it's still a very much a young wide receiver core. You talk about Michael Pittman Jr., and we all hope that he can take the next step. And I don't I think it had it not been for his compartment leg syndrome yeah. last year, he would have had a much more productive and gaudy stat. You line saw him come on at the end of the season. season last year. And I think the Colts are still very high on Desmond Patman. Desmond Patman was an active all of last year, but we saw in training camp why the Colts drafted him and they still have a lot of belief in what he can do and what he can be. And then you mentioned Paris Campbell. He hasn't in a lot of ways, he's still like a rookie because mm -hmm. he hasn't played anywhere near a full 16 game regular season schedule yet. So three of your top five wide receivers are in their third year or less. And then you still have guys that have been on this roster that have contributed for you in the past, like Ashton Doolin and DeMichael Harris. So I, that's why I think it makes a great deal of sense to bring in T.Y. Hilton to be that veteran steady presence. But, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating. We talk, do we need, do the Colts need at this juncture to bring in more wide receiver talent? With the Colts still having their top two draft picks, those premium picks, you know, wide receiver once again for the second year in a row is a very deep and talented draft class. So we'll see. I think time will tell. But for me, I think the biggest need for this, this team on offense is tight end, right? Because, you, I mean, Frank Reich talks all the time about needing that F tight end. They've got the Y guys like uh, the great inline blockers with Jack Doyle and Mo Alley-Cox. I think Mo can continue to develop and continue to progress. But, you know, we've seen in the past when this offense is at its best, they have that athletic, you know, field stressing, putting a lot of stress on the defense type of tight end, similar to how Eric Ebron was, especially inside the red zone in 2018. When you mentioned the offense as well, the offense got that boost in the run game by re-signing Marlon Mack. What does that addition do for that complement of Marlon Mack, 
Jonathan Taylor, also Naheem Hines, and Jordan Wilkins. That was huge to get Marlon Mack. You know how much that he means right. to this locker room and to that. Again, you talk about a really young yep. group of running backs as well for Scotty Montgomery, now the new running backs <laughs> coach who takes over from Tom Rathman. Just on a personal level, so incredibly excited for Marlon because that was just a raw deal last year. Un yeah. Unfortunate for him because he's in such good shape. He's coming off a 1,000-yard season, heading, heading into a contract year, and then boom. Second quarter, first game, tears his Achilles, and then it's just, you know, what do you do? You got Jonathan Taylor. It was a small sample size, but he oh. looked explosive in that first game. The entire game. offense looked yeah. electric the first, you know, 19 minutes of that game down in Jacksonville. So I thought it made perfect sense because it's low risk. You know Marlon Mack. He is a 1,000-yard runner. He knows this offensive line very well because four of the five guys that he was a 1,000-yard runner with are coming back, sans uh, Anthony Costanzo. Plus, I thought, you know, you're going to have to sign a, a fourth running back anyways. Might as well be Marlon Mack. So he comes in and, and gets another opportunity to prove that he can be the runner that we saw in 2019. And so excited that he gets that opportunity here. You talk about win-win situations. That's a phrase that we often hear from Chris Ballard, and certainly the Marlon Mack deal seems like a win-win for both sides. A couple of other free agency moves. In addition to that, the re-signing of Xavier Rhodes. You also have Isaac Rochelle, who was recently signed, defensive lineman, and then also the veteran tackle in Sam Tevy. Overall, kind of your big takeaways of the moves that have been made and maybe what we still can expect yeah. from the Colts and free agency. Yeah, I guess my biggest takeaway is, is not really surprised, to be honest with you. I mean, these are the moves that I thought the Colts would make. Um, you know, Chris Ballard, as far as his tactic goes, this is what he does. He's prudent. He's patient. He's going to stick to the value that he has on all the players. And no matter who he brings in, he's confident that those players can contribute. He's also confident in the coaching staff's ability to coach those players up and get the max value out of them. So uh, I guess mildly surprised as we sit here and talk right now that Justin Houston is still out on the open market. But as we talked about in shows past, you know, he's over the age of 30. And, you know, this might be a, a situation where the decrease in the salary cap is affecting his stock. So uh, kind of wait and see on that. But no, I guess not really surprised because the, the moves the Colts have made so far are the ones I thought they would make to this point in free agency. With the signing of the tackle, Sam Tevy, what does that mean for this offensive line? Do you believe that they're still going to try to pursue some options there? And does that make you look toward the talent that is available potentially yeah. in the draft in late April? Well, Sam Tevy gives you depth, right? He gives you a lot of depth. And that was something that going into this offseason, you were a little, we were talking about because last year with Anthony Costanzo retiring, but also you factor in Braden Smith, those two players combined to miss seven games. So tackle experience was something I thought the Colts would target in free agency. They do that with Tevy because he does have that experience. 44 starts at tackle, uh, either right tackle or left tackle in four years with the Chargers. But no, it would not surprise me at all for the Colts to continue to target that in the draft. Uh, we know that the tackle draft class is very deep. And then again, great job by Chris Ballard and the Carson Wentz trade to hang on to their two top premium picks in the first round, the second round. And so we'll see what happens there in terms of the Colts, you know, having this great offensive line, is it in their best interest to bring in a tackle on a rookie contract and maybe a fifth year option if you draft that guy in the first round? And although it is the quote unquote off season, there truly is no off season because there is always something to talk about. It's there juicy. are always moves to be made. So we will be right back here keeping you guys updated with all of those moves that unfold throughout free agency. And of course, as we look ahead to the draft at the end of April, be sure to tune in as well. We have the draft series with Colts Productions with the next pick coming up that will debut on Wednesday as well.